who is a brilliant son and a great brother. He, he came up two weeks before he died. He came home and was going to help his little sister. She was about to take her SATs in year six and uh, he was at um, Aberystwyth University doing pure maths. That's the sort of brother he was. He came home to make sure she, um, she was going to do all right in her maths and uh, in hindsight we know he was thinking about taking his own life the whole time he was with us and we had absolutely no idea. In the UK, suicide is a leading cause of death in young people and tragically in recent years there's been an increase in the number of these cases, many of which could have been prevented. Rowan was just a nice, a nice young man actually, um, very caring, loving. He was also an uh, academic achiever and, and he had lots of friends. I went down to Exeter University with him two days before he died actually and uh, I remember speaking to my, my colleague the following day uh, and, asking, and he was asking how Rome was and I was, oh, it's, it's brilliant, it's on top of the world, he's doing this, he's doing that. But obviously was something in, in his life that was overwhelming him that, that, that everybody missed, I think. Because he was obviously hurting and couldn't, and couldn't speak about it. We were in the supermarket the night before. Everything was normal. And later on, I said, no, no, I love. I said, hi, Dad. Yeah, I'll see you morning, I'll see you in the morning. Yeah, I love you, I love you too. That was what we said all the time. Just what we said all the time. And then in the morning, I, I find her dead. No idea why. For some families, their experience of suicide came completely out of the blue. The child hadn't talked to them about suicide or displayed any signs that they might be in distress. Suicide in young people is rarely caused by just one thing. Usually it follows a combination of situations or experiences that leave the young person feeling unable to cope. But there are some groups who are significantly more at risk. For example, those who've been bereaved, especially by suicide. LGBTQ young people and looks after children are all particularly vulnerable. Adverse childhood experiences can also play a part. Abuse, physical or mental ill health, substance or alcohol misuse experienced by the child or by a member of the family can all be a factor, as can social isolation, loneliness and bullying, either at home or at school. We think that uh, bullying um, should be tackled more. Um, and they do say in many schools we have zero tolerance. And really, in many cases, and I've spoken to many parents over this, uh, they are hollow words. Nathan, he was a, a very sensitive and emotional boy. He had friends, they both had friends, him and his twin brother Curtis. That seemed to change as they developed uh, into adolescents. And friendships uh, at any time of life are important, but particularly at that age. Um, Nathan became ostracised um, and as we found out later on, uh, he was bullied, being different, having a, a, a asperger. K kids can sort of be quite cruel um, and, 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 they can, and they can bully and I think it's being really having a zero tolerance on that sort of behaviour because we need to encourage kids who are feeling uncomfortable or kids who are feeling a bit within themselves to, to talk um, and that can't happen in an environment where they feel they might get ridiculed by that by either the, the peers or, or, or anybody else. Before um, he died he just spent 10 days away in Switzerland with scouts. He came home with gifts for everybody, regaled him what a wonderful time he'd had. And then on the Monday morning he got up as normal um, to go and do his paper round because he was dedicated to his paper round and he loved doing it. He got dressed as normal and he said goodbye, I love you, and out the door he went. And then we were waiting for him to come home, we were ringing his mobile and saying, Ben, where are you? And it was a police officer that answered the phone. I remember the last things that he spoke to me about and we used to think about them, why, why would he say that? But you don't want to get upset with him and you don't want to... You don't want to say anything, you know, too upset because they're going through enough anyway. 
and I'm not say <laughs> if anything happened to your mum I'd, I'd miss your mum but I wouldn't be upset and I never questioned it We know that any young person can be at risk from suicide, especially if they become overwhelmed by the stresses and pressures of life. Sometimes as adults, it's difficult for us to understand the intensity of these feelings in young people. By learning how to identify the signs that someone might be at risk, by knowing how to support them, to keep them safe, and if necessary, to direct them to the right professional help, we can all play a part in preventing suicide in children and young people. I've spent 20 years in secondary education in Merseyside and from, a, from that point of view as well as a parent of three children I would say that classroom teachers are the most likely to be approached by a child who's distressed or who wants support. It's not assistant heads or deputy heads or head teachers, they're too remote, it's the classroom teacher and in studies it's the classroom teacher who feels least able to deal with that as a situation when it arises. Every member of staff should be trained, mental health first aid, assist or even the sort of spotting the early signs because it doesn't have to be a member of the teaching staff that might be alerted to changes in any pupil's behaviour. It might not be that member of staff that that sort of student feels comfortable talking to. It might be the dinner lady, it might be a lunchtime supervisor, it might even just be the reception desk, you know, that person might be the approachable Person. It's okay to use the word suicide. We're all terrified of the word suicide in education. If you say it in school, my God, something terrible will happen. And the studies show actually it's completely the reverse. Okay? So teachers who are sitting there are afraid to say, well, have you thought about harming yourself in any way? That's a perfectly reasonable, straight up thing to say. I think the curriculum should cover mental health um, you know, awareness, coping with mental health changes as as you go through puberty, as you sort of age, as you get to exam time. I think there's a fear, isn't there, of upsetting parents and upsetting kids and I suppose unless you've gone through the process, um, you'd never realise how important um, that conversation is. Say if I said to you, well, you know, have you ever thought, have you ever thought about harming yourself? isn't going to make somebody harm themselves, okay? But if they are harming themselves, it's going to make them feel like it's okay to go, <sighs> yes. There is no evidence to suggest that talking about suicide or asking someone if they're feeling suicidal is harmful. If approached with sensitivity, asking someone if they thought about taking their own lives can create a safe space for them to open up and talk about their feelings. We've got to sort of put it out there that there's no stigma attached to any mental health issues, that we should talk about it, that we should own it, and we should know where to go to. And I think signposting, making sure that there's posters up in all the toilets or in the libraries or on the desk where they can pick up a card that gives them some kind of signposting personally. We have to be clear on this. Stigma can kill because it stops people from talking. And whilst we have this stigma and, and we're where people judge, people aren't going to talk. We are still the darkest of taboos. And even though we talk more now than what we ever have done, we're still not talking enough about suicide. Even if I go back to the school and try and promote suicide awareness, there's still a bit of a, a reluctance to do that. Uh, and, may, and maybe we do need to break down that whole stigma and just accept, that, accept, it, accept it for what it is. And, uh, and talk about it. It is a very strong stigma. People don't want to talk about it. I totally understand, but it happens and it can't be ignored. And I think um, if it brings to awareness in people and families and parents and teachers and all the agencies that are attached, that we need to talk and they need to listen. Showing compassion and listening to a young person can make a huge difference in their life. Talking to them about changes in their behaviour may be a chance to have that important, life-saving conversation. Well-being is paramount, and if well-being is put first, then education will naturally prosper, yeah. instead of putting education first. They are conjoined, they're joined at the hip, education and welfare, but well-being first. Yeah. Well-being, 
and then education and will follow. it's not just about attendance and sets. If the schools and the universities had had more information at that time, um, and, and the information was widely available, um, because if, if, if you don't know these organisations out there, you're not going to get in touch with them. I think having access to um, counsellors to support children because again we need to prepare them early to have these conversations that they're not coping or that they're finding school difficult, life difficult, finding friendship groups difficult because on the outside they might look like they're coping very well but we need to give them a kind of permission to talk about maybe things that are worrying them. How do we increase resilience in our young people? We allow them to take risks and we allow them to um, fail, pick themselves up, carry on. You know, failure used to be a dirty word in education, but it isn't a dirty word. You learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. And it's okay to make mistakes. You know, a lot of work done in schools on growth mindset training, and I think it's critical to increasing resilience in kids so that they understand that it doesn't have to be perfect first time and that things have to be achieved through hard work and practice and, and training and that not everything works out brilliantly well the first time and if it doesn't work out you're just no good at it. You, you need to be able to develop those skills that give you a positive mindset that says well you know I might not be very good at this today but I'm going to get better at it if I practice and it's not rocket science. We need people to be trained so that they're comfortable in asking um, questions and talking about suicide to people who may have suicidal thoughts. You know, the, the, the cemeteries are full of people who felt they haven't been able to talk. Sometimes there may be no signs that a child is at risk of suicide. That's why, as a society, we all need to take responsibility for looking out for our young people, offering them opportunities to talk about their feelings at every stage in their development. I'm pleased to say that the university my son attended, I've learned, um, they uh, they were so shocked after his death, collectively as a whole, as an organisation, they were affected and were determined to do something different. And the Students' Union started a campaign called Stefan's Socks. My son was very eccentric and he used to fence wearing bright pink, neon pink socks. And they introduced them and all the sporting teams wear these bright pink socks to compete with. And everybody from different universities says to them, well, what are you wearing bright pink socks? And they say, oh, well, it's Stefan's Socks because the message is it's good to talk. They do a whole campaign with freshers when they start at the university and it's called Stefan's socks and they write down their hopes and fears on socks and they pin them to a washing line in the students union and they are clearly told where to go for help when to go for help that it's okay to talk to each other and to say are you okay um, do you feel like do you feel bad do you feel like desperate do you feel that you need help and it's a way of opening communication and I, I absolutely love it. Since they introduced Stefan Socks at Aberystwyth University, they haven't had a single other suicide. Greater emphasis needs to be put on emotional well-being and mental health across families in schools right from primary school stage through to college and university and including schools with a special educational needs focus and alternative education provision. Further interventions need to be made to remove suicide methods from the internet and to encourage online safety, especially for the under 20s. Better funding and provision for children and young people's mental health services is essential. We just thought that we were dealing with stroppy teenagers um, and the, the people from the school and from the, what do you call it, the education welfare, yeah. um, they dealt with them as being stroppy, stroppy teenagers and that, and that they were only just following each other. And I just feel like they never shared any reports and um, they never went into the school um, and uh, the, with CAMS they never shared no, repo no reports. So um, who knows if they'd have shared, maybe things would have been highlighted and maybe things would have been um, more um, sympathetic and uh, they would have had more of a listening ear. The tide is turning in secondary education and money is coming in and funding and jobs are being created in order to improve the mental health provision in schools and I find that really exciting but it's like anything crumbs is it crumbs or is it the whole cake and my feeling is it's crumbs 
crumbs are better than nothing but more is needed and more funding is needed a lot more and I'm not just talking about a couple of million here and there it's substantial funding to bring the level and the standard of mental health care and provision in this country in line with physical ill health there needs to be some more input into mental health services for young people because when they're in crisis they need somebody to see them straight away and I think that an urgent appointment that takes four weeks for somebody to have crisis intervention is too long for somebody to wait. That's, that's the difference in my mind between life and death. I think a lot of the settings for support uh, take far too long, are not the appropriate help and I think they are looking down a list, a checklist. My son went to a &E, and he told them he had self-harmed and had ideation of suicide and she let him go after 40 minutes, the crisis nurse, because he was clean, he had been fed, he was making eye contact and she thought it would be fine and sent a letter to his GP who then didn't follow up and sent a letter to the student union which they took weeks to follow up and then he told them he was fine and they believed him. There needs to be more done around the mental health service and how those referrals are made and even the follow-up seems to take a long time. You know, CAMS teams, it can take a long time for a referral to be processed and I think we need to take it right back to infancy and focus on care and support around infant mental health so that can start at birth and I think the more implementation of teams around from midwives right through to you know the adult life throughout that whole spectrum of childhood there's going to be events that happen that can impact on mental health. They didn't tell us, nobody told us and we didn't know and uh, to hear that he'd actually gone to seek help and he went back again in February um, two months later and didn't wait around and I feel like the clinical nature of the setting the fact that he'd been dismissed and sent away once before made him feel even worse about admitting his vulnerability coming forward for help and he left A&E without waiting for the crisis nurse in February and in March he was dead. We thought we were being dealt with as a, a family unit and um, because they say that when you have a problem in your home with children it affects all the family and Nathan being a twin brother you would obviously think it would affect him desperately um, but I found out later that he was disregarded because he, would ne he was never he wasn't referred, referred by, the, by doctor, the doctor but we um, actually did speak yes. to the psychiatrist who came to our home yeah. about Curtis we spoke to him briefly about Nathan as well because yeah. just in, in, in passing because he was a, a twin how's his brother and we said well we've got the same issues as we have with uh, Curtis yeah I'm not an expert in the field, but I would say if someone says they are having thoughts of suicide, it's serious and it needs dealing with within 24 hours. It's not something that a letter to the GP will fix. And even if they are the sort of person who's you know, had a couple of pints and then is all sort of drama and says, oh, I'm at it, I've had enough, and goes to A&E and makes this thing, well, even so, they've still got a problem and they still need support. There's no circumstances in my mind where somebody who says... I feel suicidal should not be taken seriously. We can't solve it as individuals and, and we can't catch everybody but by being aware, by raising awareness, by encouraging people to speak there's a better chance of catching somebody who's struggling. Transitions can be a difficult and worrying time for anyone but some young people may need extra help in dealing with big changes in their lives. Roughly from the age of yeah. 13 to 14, they yeah. both began to struggle, didn't they, with their, yeah. their education yeah. and um, also struggle with their friendships. Some kind of um, intervention on transition to high school because it's a really difficult period of time of change. Some students move from a primary school without any friends and that bit about buddying people up, maybe them getting together before they actually leave primary schools and having some time together, getting to know them, linking them up. 
because it's a massive transition point and that uncertainty and that anxiety of change can have a massive impact on somebody. I think if they could just, just get children to enjoy each other's company and just put them in groups, not, not a friendship group but just a group where they can talk about you know anything, uh, the holidays, the friendships, you know what, what they do at the weekends and um, pictures they see, it's just to get them talking to each other and realise that you know they're just the same as you, they're just the same as each other, some may be shyer and um, some may be much stronger but at the end of the day behind all that they're all children. And so no Growing child feels ostracised. Ostracised, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 We didn't get anything out of our inquest that gave us any lessons to learn about Ben's life, about anything that was affecting him, things that we might have missed as parents. Um, you know, I think about my training as a nurse and didn't see anything, any changes in Ben. But also I think that's a lesson learned for us that, you know, the happiest child in the school, the person that's got a group of friends around them all the time, that participates, that joins in, might also be the person that's struggling inside. When you're bereaved in this way, it is just the most vile thing I can ever imagine happening to anybody because the pain is so intense and then you have questions and you have things that you want answering and when the coroner decides that he doesn't think it's relevant but it is to you as a mother uh, there's an, in, uh, an intense frustration and uh, anger that you generate and that's frustrating because the coroners are dealing with it as well this is a case we have to decide how this person died legally but actually it's far far more to the families and I think at a time when this is the worst time in someone's life if you have an opportunity to try and make that better or you choose to be jobs worthy and make it worse you have real questions to ask about that Given that the outcome for people who are bereaved through suicide isn't great anyway, for coroners, police, officials in that moment to, act, I would say, make it worse is genuinely unforgivable. We need better training and support for those who are dealing with families who have lost a child to suicide at every step in the process. Compassion is key. If you're supporting a young person who's having mental health difficulties or experiencing suicidal thoughts, if you're bereaved or if you're supporting a family member or a friend who's bereaved, please take time to talk to someone about your feelings. Self-care is vital. We need to look after ourselves as well as each other. Well, committed suicide is a harsh term, but they took their own life. It's a nicer term. And when we're bereaved by suicide, we need you to be nice to us. Because we are very fragile and vulnerable, we become high risk ourselves. I don't understand why, when we know how much each suicide costs, the government costs the country, why we don't put a fraction of that money into preventing all this nightmare? You know, every time we don't do it, every time somebody slips through the net, every time somebody goes back from A&E who's clean and well fed and has had a pizza, uh, that's another two million and a tragedy in a family that's ripped apart in a way that they'll never ever recover. The best you can hope for is that you learn to live with it. And learning to live with it is a very, very difficult and long process. When you've got stigma as well, where people say that um, those who take their life are selfish. Um, and one of the things that was direct to me was family to blame here. Just four words that somebody wrote in the comments of the newspaper, you know, I, I'm at the lowest point in my life that I have ever, ever been. And then somebody said, is your fault? You know, that, that, things like that can tip people over the edge. It could have tipped me over the edge. That one moment and <sighs> your whole life as you knew it is gone. And the process of learning to live with it is learning that that life that you had before that moment, it's no more. And you have a life before and a life afterwards. And the life afterwards is hard. It's hard. There is, of course, no single solution to this situation. But we can all play a part in helping to prevent suicide in children and young people by making mental health 
everyone's business. By destigmatizing suicide, by talking openly about mental health, by campaigning for a better funded and compassionate mental health provision, by encouraging resilience in our children and young people, listening to them with compassion and taking the concerns and worries seriously.